Hi, and welcome to the American Society of ECHO E3 lecture series. My name is Lucy Safi, and I am Director of Interventional Echocardiography at Hackensack University Medical Center and Chair of the ASC Emerging Echo Enthusiasts, also known as E3, Special Interest Group. This special interest group provides an opportunity for early career physicians, sonographers, and trainees who are interested in echocardiography to present, interact, and discuss echocardiographic topics. Each lecture is formatted as a 30-minute didactic lecture followed by a panel discussion. On the panel will be two moderators and an expert in the field. During the discussion section, the panelists will also answer audience questions, so please enter your questions in the Q&A box below. This virtual lecture series will be recorded and later available online via the ASC E3 website. To join ASC E3 Special Interest Group, log into your ASC account and under Update My Profile, click Specialty Interest Groups and then click E3. Today's lecture is on pediatric echocardiography. Joining me today as co-moderator is Dr. Gregory Tatum. Dr. Tatum is Associate Professor of Medicine at Duke University Medical Center and Medical Director of the Duke's Children's Specialty Services of Greensboro. He also serves as Director of Education and Director of Quality in the Pediatric Echo Lab. He is an active member of the ASC and serves on the Education Committee, Council on Pediatric Congenital Heart Disease Steering Committee, and is on the ASC Foundation's Board of Directors. He is a graduate of the inaugural class of the ASC Leadership Academy. Welcome, Dr. Tatum, and thank you for being my co-moderator today. Our physician expert is Dr. Pini Joan. Dr. Joan is Professor of Pediatric Cardiology at the University of Colorado. She's also Director of 3D Echo and Echo Quality at the Children's Hospital in Colorado. Dr. Joan is very involved in the ASC as a member of Pediatric Congenital Heart Disease Council and on the ASC Industry Relations Committee. She's also a graduate of the inaugural class of the ASC Leadership Academy. Welcome Dr. Joan, it's great to have you here today as our expert. Our Thank guest, you, Lucy. Oh, my pleasure. Our guest speaker is Dr. Uh, Sujita Budi. Dr. Budi is an as associate in the Department of Pediatrics and an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Radiology at the University of Washington School of Medicine. She is director of non-invasive imaging research and the co-director of cardiac MRI department at Seattle's Children's Hospital, where she also works as a pediatric cardiologist. Dr. Buddy serves on the ASC Bylaws and Ethics Committee and is on the ASC Scientific Sessions Planning Committee. Welcome, uh, Sujita. We look forward to your presentation and you may share your slides. Thank you, Lucy. And thanks everyone uh, for joining us today at this time. Uh, this is a talk on pediatric echocardiogram, and um, I'll briefly review the basics of pediatric echocardiogram, the segmental approach, and focus also on how to optimize image in pediatrics. Well, for disclosures, I have no disclosures other than that I'm a pediatric cardiologist, so this will come through an eye of a pediatric cardiologist. In this talk, I will focus on, as I discussed, about segmental approach, everything coming back to the basics of how do we approach every segment in the heart as we put together the story. And we'll then review image optimization and few interesting cases. So pediatric echo, how is it different compared to the adults? As we all know, when we come to image quality, well, it's almost always really good. Well, but that's not the entire story because most of these kids don't cooperate well then what do we do? Well, we have to stick to our approach, which is going by the systematic approach, making sure we follow the protocol, going through step by step. However, if you have an active patient, then just go for the gold. Everything else you get is just a bonus. So what is segmental approach? It's basically the basics of going step by step in a logical way to describe every segment as you can have a variety of combinations of atrial, ventricular, and great vessel um, abnormalities here in congenital heart disease. So the Murphy's law is anything that can go wrong will. So how do we describe a congenital heart disease? And if we go into the details, there are essentially two major schools of description. One is the Anderson School and the other one is Van Praag. Some aspects of this remain controversial. 
Oops, sorry. Okay, so if we go to the Anderson description here, basically we describe congenital heart disease through sequential segmented analysis. So, and we avoid any speculations about embryology in this description. On the other hand, if we are going by the Van Pratt description, here, the morphology of a chamber is determined on the most constant component. So those are the basic rules, but there is a lot of overlap. So again, if you go by Anderson description, you describe each of the segments separately and the junctions that are associated with them. By Van Pratt's goal, if you have, you give a alphabet to each of the segments, and then you have a complex combination and a variety of congenital heart disease that can happen. But we don't have to get confused because no matter how you look at it, it is what it is. So we will stick to the basics. So if we come back and say, okay, how is the layout of the heart? We can think of it as this three-storied house. It has three floors. The, the, the bottom floor is the atria. And then the first floor is the ventricles. And above that is the great arteries. Now connecting these floors are the staircases. So the one connecting the atria and the ventricle is the AV junction, and the one connecting the ventricles to the great arteries is the conus or infundibulum. And this house has two entrances, which is the systemic and pulmonary veins. So as we stick to these basics, we have to describe each one on its own. And how do we image the heart is exactly similar to the adult um, scanning, where you have four views, the parasternal, the apical, subcostal, and suprasternal. And all these four views have two axes in them, the long axis and the short axis. And the details are not very different from the adult imaging, but if we want to go through the details, this article by Lai, by Wyman Lai in 2006, has a very good description and references to performing a pediatric echocardiogram. And anyone interested in pediatric echo should definitely review this. So, okay, I have all the basic information. I got this, where do I start? Well, the first basic thing is the abdominal situs. So where is the abdominal situs and what are the things on the left and right of the midline? So here, as you see, the liver is on the right, the stomach and spleen are on the left, and this would be situs solidus. If this is completely inverted, it is situs inversus. But it's not going to be this simple, you will all obviously always see a in-between scenarios where everything is looking like right-sided or everything is looking like left-sided, and that varies from asplenia to polysplenia. But I think as long as we got the basics of what is solitus and inverses, that's a good, good starting point. And how do we do that on echo? The subcostal views. So as we see in the subcostal view, the IVC is to the right of the midline, and the aorta is to the left of the midline. Similarly, you see the location of liver and stomach in situs solidus. If the exact opposite would be in situs inversus. Then again, you can see a combination in between, but these are the basics. Well, once we got the abdominal situs, we have to get to the first entrances into the heart, and those are the systemic veins. The systemic veins are the SVC and the IVC, and also there are accessory venous structures. Let us look at this in individually. So the IVC, as we see in this long axis view, we see the long axis of the IVC draining into the right atrium, and we also see the hepatics coming in. But when do we get concerned about interrupted IVC? Well, if you don't see that long axis IVC draining into the atrium in your subcostal view, then the suspicion comes in and you look for other signals especially as you see in this right-hand image, there is increased venous return from the SVC. And when you see this, you already have the suspicion of interrupted IVC, and you're looking for alternative sources for the blood from the lower part of the body to get back to the heart. And that could happen either through the azygous vein into the SVC, or it could happen through the hemiazygous vein into the innominate vein. And we see both the examples here. And again, as we see in this image, you could see the azygous vein draining into the SVC on the right side, or the hemiazygous vein draining into the innominate vein on the left side in cases of interrupted IVC. Now, what about a persistent left SVC? Most of the time, this is a normal variant. 
And how do we get suspicion for this is when we see that the coronary sinus is dilated. As you see here, there is an example of a dilated coronary sinus. And on the other hand, we see a normal coronary sinus. So when we see a dilated coronary sinus, we have to look for clues of a LSBC. And once we know that there is an LSBC, the important thing to rule out is if there is a bridging vein or not, because this is important in children who are going for cardiac surgeries. So as we see in the example here, there are bilateral SBCs, but there is no bridging vein or innominate vein as we see on the other side. Okay, now that we got uh, the systemic veins done, the pulmonary veins, as we know, they come into the left atrium. We just have to make sure that we are assessing them well. So the pulmonary veins are very well seen in most of the pediatric cases from the suprasternal view, which is called the crab view, whereas you see on color all four pulmonary veins coming back to the left atrium. Okay, now that we got the venous entrance into the heart, let's look at the um, atrium itself. So the right atrium and the left atrium, how do we define them? It's easy in a normal heart, but when there is question of which chamber is which and we have to identify them, then we go to the embryologic features. And the most important embryologic feature for the right atrium is its appendage, which is a broad-based triangular appendage. On the other hand, for the left atrium, it's a narrow-based finger-like appendage. Now, while these are the most important features, they're not very easy most of the time to see on the echocardiogram. And then we may also look into other features, especially the IVC. The chamber that receives the IVC would be the right atrium, and the right atrium could also receive the coronary sinus and the SVC, but the appendage and the IVC are the more dominant features. As we see in the pictures here, we see for the right atrium has the triangular broad-based appendage, unlike a finger-like appendage for the left atrium. And this is more easily seen on the TE images. Again, we see the right atrial appendage and the left atrial appendage here. And once you have this identified, you can have in your mind if this is a solitus or a mirror image situation where in situs solitus, the right or the atrial situs solitus, the right atrium is on the right, left atrium is on the left. You can have cases with mirror image positions or bilateral right or left isomerism. Well, once we got the atria identified, the next is the ventricles. And how do we identify right and left ventricle? The most important feature for the right ventricle and the left is the AV valve septal leaflet attachments. So for the right ventricle, the septal attachment of AV valve is more apical compared to the left ventricle. And we'll see some pictures of that. And as we also know, the left ventricle has the smooth septal surface, which is important in identifying it. Beyond that, the presence of moderator band on the right side is also useful. And we'll talk a bit about the right and left ventricular topology. But as we see in this picture, the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve, the tricuspid valve septal leaflet is more apical compared to the mitral valve. And as we go through that, okay, now we know where the atria are, where the ventricle are, but we also need to give it a name based on the ventricular looping. So how do we define ventricular looping? So the concept is the same. You want to put the palm of your hand on the ventricular septum. So you want to be in the right ventricle, want to put your palm on the septal surface, and you want your thumb to be pointing into the inflow and the fingers into the outflow. If you're able to do this with the right hand, it's a D looping. If you're able to do this with the left hand, it's L looping. And it's, it's sometimes hard in extremely complex hearts, but most of the time it's pretty easy to figure out whether it's D looping ventricle or L looping ventricle. And as you see here in these examples, you see on the normal heart, again, the tricuspid valve is on the right side, the right ventricle is on the right side, and even though if we don't see the outflows here, for the limited part of inflows, you can see that if you put your septum on the RV septal surface, your palm on the RV septal surface, your right hand thumb will point into the inflow. On the other hand, for the picture on the left side, where you see that the left-sided AV valve is more apical and the right-sided ventricle has more smooth surface, so the left ventricle is on the right side, the right ventricle is on the left side, 
And if you want to do the same thing, putting your hand, palm on the septal surface of the right ventricle and your thumb towards the inflow, this would be L looping. Well, we got that straight. Now let's look at the great arteries. Well, we know the pulmonary artery and the aorta, and how do we define them? The most important feature is the branches to the body. The pulmonary artery does not give branches to the body, and the aorta gives branches to the body. Now, as we all know, the aorta can sometimes give rise to branches to the lungs, so that is not a defining character, but presence of coronary arteries and branches to the body is defining the aorta. And the pulmonary artery does not give branches to the body. So as we do the sweep here on this first image, you see the aorta and the pulmonary artery, and you see the crossing of the great arteries, which is a feature for the normal heart and the normal great arterial relationship. However, if you see this parallel great arteries, then you are concerned about some sort of transposition. And as you continue to follow the great arteries, you would see that the, the great artery on the top is the artery that's giving rise to the head and neck vessels and vessels to the body, which is the aorta. And the great artery on the bottom is bifurcating to the lungs. So now you can identify which artery is which based on further interrogating the great arteries. And now once you have the great arteries defined, as you see, you can define them as situs solidus, where the aorta is to the right of the pulmonary artery and inverses where the aorta is to the left of the pulmonary artery. Okay, I have all my anatomical features identified. Now, how do I put them together? How do I tell the story? So once you have all of them identified, it all comes down to are they in concordance or discordance? So if the right atrium is connected to the right ventricle, and the left atrium to the left ventricle, there is atrioventricular concordance. And similarly, you can think of ventricular arterial if they have normal connections. However, if the right atrium is connected to the left ventricle or the left atrium is connected to the right ventricle, it is atrioventricular discordance, similarly as you would identify for ventricular arterial discordance. Again, these are the same examples of how the atria are either concordant with the ventricles or if there is atrioventricular discordance on the other image. And once before you leave scanning, you have to make sure that you looked at all these connections, identified the chambers, but also looked at any other shunts because all of these come in combination. You may have an associated BSD, you may have an ASD, you may have valve. Uh, function issues. So we had to make sure that all of those are covered before you leave the bedside. And once that's done, you can put all this information into your diagram. Okay, where are the veins coming? Where is the SVC, IVC coming in? Where are the pulmonary veins coming in? Once that's done, you can identify the atrial chambers. Are they on the right or the left? And what? where are the ventricles located? And where are the arteries connected? Once you have this, you can determine if there is AV and VA concordance or discordance. And based on the other shunts, you can describe the rest of the anatomy. So again, you have the atrial situs identified, you have the ventricular looping identified, and you have the great artery position identified. And once this is done, you can map them into one of these complex connections um, and identify the pathology. So to conclude for the imaging itself, the first part is don't be afraid of pediatric patients. You know everything. Just follow the rules, just follow the sequence, and you can put it all together. The most important thing is to be organized. And whenever something is not making sense or seems too complex, come back to the basics and follow by sequence. Do your checklist because it's, it's not easy to go back again. It's painful. And again, here the role is being a medical detective, so enjoy that fun. Well, that was for the uh, segmental analysis, but few topics on image optimization. So how do we optimize image in pediatrics? It's again, coming back to the basics and telling the story. Depth. Again, I, I know we do the depth uh, optimization even in adults, but the reason why this is important in peds is because you have to change it by image by image. Um, different images will need different depth and you want to optimize your depth to get the highest frame rate and better resolution. 
gain, again, while doing the overall gain does help, it sometimes can deteriorate the image quality. So it's important to also adjust the time gain controls. But most important, again, is to frequently adjust the depth and the gain in the image as you go. Coming to the probes, the low frequency probes, as you know, have high penetration and they're great for subcostal images, but the high frequency images are great for high resolution and something like coronaries. And in pediatrics, again, you may have to use all four probes or all available probes in, a, in one child. So don't be concerned to go back and forth between the probes, rather it's always very useful to go back and forth between depending on the images of interest. And as you change the probes, as you change your depth, remember to adjust your focus into the area of highest, um, where you need the highest resolution. Okay, and again, remember, we don't know the end of the story till we read the whole book. So it's important to gather all the other features, particularly in peats, blood pressure. If you want to know where your RV pressures are, you need the systemic blood pressure. It can be variable in each child. You need the height and weight because again, Z-scores depend on the height and weight. And to make sure you gather all the info, do the basic tuning for each image. And most importantly, in PEATS again, where you have shunts and various uh, connection issues, long, slow label sweeps are extremely useful. Can't um, focus more on that, both in 2D and color. And for shunts, always make sure that the Dopplers are on axis. So this is an example of a subcostal image, which is uh, nicely done in a slow and long sweep. It's also nicely labeled anterior to posterior, so the physician who is not there at the time of scan still understands where the connections are. This is extremely useful in pathology. Well, let's look at few cases where, again, the image optimization would be very valuable. In this case of a simple PDA, where the PDA is entering the MPA, the appropriate Doppler scale is very useful in identifying the shunt direction. Okay. And it's again important to get both pulse Doppler to identify the direction of the shunt and also continuous Doppler to assess the peak velocities across the shunt. And you see something like a VSD sweep the entire ventricular septum because sometimes they come with friends, there are more shunts than one. And again, long sweeps help here and on axis Doppler to get the highest velocities. For something as simple as pulmonary veins, it's important to make sure that our color box is on the appropriate size, but even more importantly is the color settings. Like if you see in this example, when we, the Nyquist is 108, there's poor filling in the pulmonary veins, but when you optimize your color scale, we can see all four pulmonary veins coming back to the left atrium. Well, coming to coronaries, um, again, we can most often see coronaries in pediatric cases, but it's important to optimize the image. Having a small color box that's over the coronary origin, but also includes the aorta. You want to zoom in, but not over zoom it. So you can see the coronaries very nicely. For coronaries in particular, again, start with the highest frequency transducer that helps most with the image quality. Turn down the compression and reduce your depth to include both the coronary and the aortic valve for context. Same uh, principle for imaging, adjusting the focal zone. But again, very important to confirm this by color Doppler because most of the time there are fake out appearances of the coronary origins and we have to confirm it by color. And we have to look at both the left and the right coronary arteries separately. So let's see some examples. This is a nice example of a left coronary artery where you see it by 2D and by color and you see nice color direction into the LAD and um, the circumflex. An example of the right coronary artery, again by 2D and by color, again important to confirm by color, but you see it very nicely with flow into the right coronary artery. Well, let's now see a few examples of pathology. Well, as we see on this image, both by 2D and color, the right coronary artery is coming from left word, from the left word cusp. So this is anomalous origin of the right coronary artery from the left cusp. 
the incidence is thought to be pretty low, but um, again, very important to diagnose, especially if children are com coming in with concerns of syncope or chest pain with exertion. Similarly here, we are looking at another coronary, is this normal? Well, we never trust a, um, a, frame, a, a still frame image like this. So we'll look at a cine image and we see color flow from in the left coronary arising from the right coronary cusp. So this is anomalous left coronary coming off the right coronary cusp. Again, low incidence, but, um, can, but um, something that very likely will need surgical correction. Well, what is this? Is this normal? Like on a, just on a 2D appearance, it looks like maybe the left coronary is coming off normally and the bifurcation looks normal, but the takeaway point is the color direction. And as you see, the LAD has flow reversal. And if you further interrogate, you'll see that this is a coronary, which is anomalous left coronary arising from the pulmonary artery. And if we look in detail, we'll see that the left coronary artery ostium from the aorta side is absent. And is this normal? It's hard to say on the still frame if you're even looking at a coronary, but as we play this image, you'll see coronary artery aneurysms in the left and right coronary artery. And this can be seen in conditions like Kawasaki disease in pediatric patients. Well, we'll also look at a few examples of congenital heart disease and what can be seen when you're scanning adult patients after they had their surgical repair in infancy. So just to start off a basic uh, common congenital heart disease is transposition of great arteries. And as you see here, there is atrioventricular concordance in the sense that right atrium is connecting to right ventricle, left atrium is connecting to left ventricle, but there is ventricular arterial discordance the sense that RV is connecting to the aorta and the left ventricle is connecting to the pulmonary artery. So how do you repair this? Well, while there are different approaches, the most common approach is arterial switch, where as you see, the arteries are switched around. And when you see these patients and follow up, the things to follow among many others is the coronary arteries, this neo-aortic valve, but also the branch pulmonary arteries, because after this repair, as you see, the branch pulmonary arteries straddle the aorta and they can develop some narrowing and flow acceleration. If we look at an example here, this is a child who underwent um, transposition switch with art arterial switch repair, and later had significant aortic valve insufficiency as we see here. As we look at the branch pulmonary arteries, you see the orientation is different here. The aorta is in the center, and the right pulmonary artery is on the right of the aorta, and the left pulmonary artery straddles on the left of the aorta. And as you see by color Doppler, there is flow acceleration into the branch pulmonary arteries. And on this continuous wave Doppler, you see that there is um, higher velocities across these branch pulmonary arteries. Another example is a ROS operation. So usually in children who had significant aortic insufficiency as babies or any other aortic valve pathology, they can undergo ROS uh, pr procedure where the pulmonary valve is used as neo-aortic valve. And for the RV outflow, we have a conduit connecting the right ventricle to the pulmonary arteries. And as we follow these patients um, into adulthood, we are looking at this neo-aortic valve function and also the conduit. As you see here, this is an example of a, a child post ROS procedure. Here, ventricular function is normal, but that's something you want to follow after ROS um, and the coronaries. Again, there is only trivial AI in this particular case. But as you look into the RV to PA conduit, sometimes there can be narrowing with flow acceleration in the first image or some uh, flow reversal and some um, insufficiency in some of the cases. And both these need long-term follow-up. Another example is congenitally corrected transposition. Here, what we have is ventricular inversion. So everything else was staying in their own place, but the ventricles are in, position is inverted. So as a result, there is atrioventricular discordance and also ventriculoarterial discordance. So the right atrium is connecting to the left ventricle, which is again connecting to the pulmonary artery. Blue blood is going to the lungs, red blood is going to the body artery, but the ventricles are inverted. Well, as long as imaging is concerned, we don't have to worry too much. We still follow our basic steps and 
what you would see as you're scanning is in your four chamber view, the left side of the AV valve is more epically displaced, rather more as an Epstein's here. And the right side of the AV valve um, is, is higher up there and the septal surface of the right ventricle is smooth compared to the left. So the right sided ventricle is the left ventricle and the left sided ventricle is the right ventricle. And as you sweep into the outflows, you will see that the left ventricle, which is on the right side, is connecting to the pulmonary arteries. Now it's hard to say that's pulmonary, you'll just have to believe me, but that's the pulmonary artery. And as you sweep on the left side, you'll see that um, it's connecting to the, the right ventricle is connecting to the aorta and there are parallel great arteries. Another couple of simple examples are uh, this child who had a VSD that was uh, not repaired. So as you see, there is VSD. You would of course look into the entire ventricular septum to make sure that there are no additional VSDs. But important in these cases is also look, to look into other things like this RV outflow. And you see flow acceleration in the RV outflow going into the PA, which is start of, kind of starting in the RV body. And as you see Doppler, you see the uh, peak velocities here with flow in the direction away from the RV into the PAs. And this is a double chambered right ventricle in a child with VSD developed later in life. And this is the last example of a child who underwent coaptation of aorta repair with end to end anastomosis early in childhood. But a follow up echo again shows flow acceleration in the aorta. And if you look at the Doppler, you see high velocities with flow continuing into diastole, all consistent with coaptation. But if you don't get such great images in adults, which, some, which almost often happens, then even the abdominal aortic Doppler here, as you see with low amplitude and diastolic flow continuation is also concerning for coaptation. So these are some tips to scan a pediatric patient. And um, I'd like to thank you for uh, perhaps for making some time to attend this webinar today. I would especially like to thank three of my sonographers, Heidi C, Heidi, Brianna and Heidi Broches who helped uh, with this presentation and their excellent storytellers at our place. Um, I think now we are open for panel discussion and questions. Thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, if you could just unshare your slides, um, we can go ahead into our first question. Um, again, I wanted to remind the audience that uh, if you have any questions for any members of the panelists, feel free to en enter them in the Q&A box below. You know, as an adult cardiologist that focuses on valvular and congenital heart disease, I wanted to ask um, a question that is always burning for me, and, and that is, why is it that on echo uh, for pediatrics that the pediatricians love to show the apical and subcostal views inverted? Um, so, Penny, maybe you can help uh, explain that and educate me on that. Um, so, uh, we like to see things more anatomically correct. And so, when we're referring right and left, um, it makes more sense uh, for us in pediatric, and especially um, we want to see the heart um, when the patient is not standing on its head. So, we like to see them with their feet on the floor. So that's easier to understand. And also um, with complex congenital heart disease, Sujatha did a great job is that in your subcostal sweep and your apical, you cannot be inverted. Otherwise it makes the connection a little bit difficult to see or difficult to decipher the different parts of the complex. And when you're doing connections from the atria to the ventricle and then to the great arteries, if it's inverted, it makes it a little bit difficult to understand. It makes a lot of sense. Definitely makes more sense. The, the simple answer is it's the right way to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, th there was a question from the audience and, and maybe um, Dr. Budi, you'd like to answer this one. Um, they, they asked in which views can we look for the right atrial appendage? I think a right atrial appendage is probably the hardest uh, in transthoracic echo uh, than even the left atrial appendage. Um, sometimes you see it well in the short axis views, um, parasternal short axis views. 
um, I would say is the most easiest of everything, but subcostal views too around the aorta is a good view to look at it. Um, Craig and Penny, do you have other thoughts on most easiest way? Yeah, so if you are um, in the subcostal image, you wanna do a sagittal view where you see the bicable SVC IVC view, and then you gotta tilt anteriorly to see the atrial appendage. That's a very similar view if you were to do a high right parasternal, um, it'll bring the bicaval view in and if you tilt anteriorly, you can see that as well. And that would be the similar image as a TE. If you had your omniplane at 90 degrees and then just turn your hand to the right, you would be able to see their right atrial appendage. Another question on views, how do you differentiate the esophagus vein from the hemiesophagus vein? So the esophagus vein is coming into the SVC. So it's coming on the right side into the SVC. The hemiesophagus vein is draining into the left side into the innominate vein. So you know, you're either looking on the right or the left. Mm -hmm. So what are your recommendations if you can't find all pulmonary veins from the crab view. I know that's a very difficult view to get, at least in, in adults. Um, so what are your recommendations? I don't know, uh, Greg, if you have any. any uh, yeah, yeah. so, so seeing the pulmonary veins is, is actually extremely important in, in pediatric cardiology. A lot of the lesions that we see, even something as simple as an atrial septal defect can have associated pulmonary venous anomalies. And in the crab view, um, in particular, we can be misled. So kids with total anomalous pulmonary venous return, sometimes in the crab view, it will appear that the, the pulmonary veins come together and drain into the left atrium. So um, actually seeing the, the pulmonary veins from multiple views is, is really a critical part of pediatric echocardiography. My favorite, if I, if I had to pick a single view, my favorite echo view of all is um, showing the right upper pulmonary vein from the subcostal view. So from a subcostal sagittal view, um, where you have the IVC and SVC coming together with just a slight um, tilt to the patient's right, you can get a beautiful view of the right upper pulmonary vein coming in uh, to the left atrium very clearly. And it is the one where you can very distinctly see, see that vein. Um, from the apical view, we often see the left upper pulmonary vein come in very clearly from an anterior to posterior relationship. Um, and then we can see the left lower pulmonary vein coming in directly posterior to anterior. On the right side, um, often it, it's hard to see a full length of, of which right-sided vein you're coming in. And depending on how you're holding your transducer from an apical view, it is, it is possible to show either the right upper or the right lower pulmonary vein. Um, but again, the, the upper veins um, come anterior to posterior. So the right upper vein will sort of hug the atrium as it comes in, whereas the lower vein will come in in a more direct course that can help you differentiate the two. Um, from the um, subcostal view, we can see that the, the veins besides the right upper as you, as you sweep through. And then even from the, the peristernal view, often from the long axis view, you can see both lefts coming in at, at your reference view. And as we rotate around to the short axis view, um, often we can get the, the right lower. And then from the uh, a modified um, right, or sorry, modified personal short view as you pull upwards um, towards the level of the SVC, um, that's actually a great view to see the right upper come in, uh, especially in people with superior sinus venosis defects. A lot of times you'll, you'll actually see it draining into the superior vena cava in that view. That's amazing that you can get all the veins, um, you know, how many of those views do you think we would be able to get? I know it's a pediatric but uh, lecture, but how many of those views do you think we'd be able to get in adults? Uh, in the adults, you, you often can get the apical views um, <laughs> and, and get the, the veins coming in there. Um, the peristernal, surprisingly, um, f fairly frequently, you can get uh, a pulmonary venous veins coming in um, in, in a center adult with good windows in, in a um, larger adult, it becomes much more difficult. Um, the subcostal views, uh, it's very difficult, um, but, but uh, every once in a while, tilting over, you're able to get that right upper from an adult as well. Mm -hmm. 
And, and thanks, Greg, for bringing that up. Um, I, I think that's extremely important. The point he made is the crab view can be misleading. So especially if you are scanning a newborn, a neonate with concern of cyanosis, extremely important to show the pulmonary veins in a same view where you're seeing the mitral well too, because you don't want to be misled by a confluence behind the atrium. So you want to see the pulmonary veins coming in into a chamber that's connecting through the mitral valve into the ventricle. And apical views are perfect for that. Um, and, and maybe in adults, one thing to consider is also a sweep. If you're going from four chamber to kind of five chamber view, you may be able to differentiate sometimes between the right lower and the right upper pulmonary vein. But sometimes they're so close, it's hard. So in the, oh, go ahead. in the adult, sometimes you can do in between your parasternal and parasternal. So do a high right parasternal, you can get the SVC and the pulmonary veins. Or if you go move into the mid, not really the short axis view, but in between the short and the supersternal notch view, you could sometimes get the pulmonary veins from there. But it is very tough in the adults. I just want to circle back to the comment on sweeping because I think that's a very intimidating um, you know, images to obtain. And for the sonographers who are watching and interested in pediatric imaging, scanning, what helpful hints can you give the sonographers on how to really master these sweeps? So I think um, uh, the sweeps, you start from posterior to anterior uh, in the parasternal long and parasternal short and apical. So um, typically, we're not all digital now, but if you go systematic posterior to anterior sweep, you can typically get all the information you need. Um, do you have any other tricks, uh, Greg? Yeah, I, I would say especially for the, the adult sonographers who are tasked with, with imaging kids um, for congenital screening, um, consistently scanning in one direction. Um, when it's a complex lesion and you scan up and then you scan down and then you scan back up all in the same sweep, mm -hmm. and that's when it gets very difficult to interpret. So, so um, you know, as uh, Dr. Budi said in, in her presentation, labeling the direction that you sweep, um, that, that way, if you get confused and like, I can't remember, I'm supposed to do anterior, posterior, and you do it backwards, we know you're doing it backwards if you label that you did it anterior, posterior. Um, you know, the, the convention is, as, as Dr. Joan said, we, we sweep, um, you know, posterior, anterior, but, but the more important thing is, is sweep in one direction and one direction only. Jeannie, yeah, I wanted to ask you a question. You know, recently there's been a lot of reports, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, of a lot of Kawasaki now in pediatrics. Um, you know, what are some of the things that we should look for on pediatric echo in a patient with Kawasaki disease? So um, Kawasaki disease is an inflammatory disorder from unknown cause. Um, Dr. Kawasaki reported this in 1967, and we still haven't found the cause. Now with the pandemic of COVID, we now have multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children and also in adults. They're very similar to Kawasaki patient where they have very high inflammatory markers they have coronary artery issues and they have ventricular dysfunction. So what to look for in Kawasaki patients are the coronaries. They're first, they can get dilated. 25% of the patients that are untreated will get dilated coronaries. Ventricular function disorder about, occurs in about 10% of the patients. Pericardial effusion can also occur. Um, AV valve regurgitation can also occur in dilated ascending aorta or pulmonary artery. Dilated pulmonary artery is very rare. I've only seen it in two of my patients here. We see about 80 to 90 Kawasaki patients a year. In the MISC world, it's very similar. You look at function, you look at coronaries, you look at pericardial effusion, AV valve regurgitation. And the MIC children are a lot sicker than the Kawasaki patients. They have very, probably three times the inflammatory markers as the Kawasaki patients. Their clinical presentation have red eyes um, and rash. Um, a lot of them present with high, very high fever and vomiting and diarrhea. 
which is very different from the Kawasaki patients. So Kawasaki patient, you know, shock probably occurs in 5% of the time, but they usually present with upper respiratory stuff, red eyes, rash, and puffy hands and feet. MIC children present with shock in about 30 to 50% of the time. So they're a lot sicker. But the essential feature that you would look for in echo would be the coronary function, AV valve regurgitation, and pericardial effusion. Uh, thanks, Lee. That was a, a great answer. Def definitely uh, something that we're learning more and more about as time goes on. And uh, unfortunately, seeing more and more um, very sick kids. Um, so, uh, moving on to a slightly different topic, um, one of the audience members uh, stated that at times they'll see a small shunt in the parasternal long axis view, um, but when they switch to short axis, uh, they'll they'll see a shunt in a one o'clock position. And and how do you differentiate? Um, if you're seeing a simple subpulmonic VSD versus two different types of, of shunts, uh, when do we actually say subarterial sh shunt? So, so I would sort of tie into that. Um, when we see a VSD, um, what is the best way to evaluate for multiple VSDs? What, what are some of the technical tricks to make sure um, we're, we're seeing extension of a single defect versus two separate defects? And if it's a large one, not missing smaller secondary VSD. So the shore axis sweep is probably the best uh, to look at all these different types of VSDs. So if you were to look at the shore axis um, with the ventricle, like a bullseye, right? Um, if you look at it around the clock phase, 12 o'clock is a supercrystal VSD or a subarterial VSD, 12 o'clock to one o'clock. 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock in the shore axis view is probably your paramembranous VSD. Now, if you sweep down to the ventricular septum where you see the VSD at one o'clock, that will be an anterior muscular VSD. If it's at 12 o'clock in the middle of the septum, this is below the aortic valve, would be a mid muscular VSD. And if it's at uh, nine o'clock in the muscle area, that would be your posterior muscular VSD. Now, VSDs, you have to be careful in infants. Um, when they're just born, their PVR is high, so you may not see the shunts. It's only when their pulmonary vascular resistance has dropped, then you can see the shunts. Be careful in your peristronal long axis view. Sometimes you have heavy trabeculation in the RV, you can see color going into the RV, but they don't cross over to the ventricle on the left side or the left side to the right ventricle, then those are not real VSDs. So you have to be careful when you see um, a defect, you need to see it in two different views. So I always teach my fellows and students and sonographers that if you're gonna see something, you will see it in two different views. So personal long axis and then personal short axis or sometimes apical. But what, what are your um, routines, uh, Shujati, when you're looking at VSDs? Um, I mean, completely agree with your uh, description of you know, classifying the VSDs into different types. Um, I think that's how we do it too. But again, I think the, the thing is the sweeps, right? And when you do the sweeps, you can see one VSD, it's the same VSD that's extending posterior, anterior, um, but uh, the stories in the sweeps. Sometimes it's also worth doing color compares, even though you lose the frame rate, but after you caught your basic well-defined images, then you can go through color compares to kind of track the VSD in 2D and color. Um, and, you know, presence or absence of conus septum also uh, helps you differentiate between a, um, a subarterial VSD or a perimembranous VSD. That's great. I mean, uh, Greg, do you do similarly just recommend the sweeps for, for these multiple views? Yeah, and I think anytime that you have a, a, a large VSD doing the sweep to, to is critical to see are there any muscle bundles that are dividing it that could cause your surgeon to, to falsely underestimate the size of the VSD at the time of, of surgery. Um, it, in order to determine if there's a secondary one, um, 
you know, making sure you have Nyquist limits turned way down um, will help bring out the VSD. Um, in term of, terms of nomenclature, um, th that is one of the areas that pediatric cardiologists have, have not been uh, as consistent as we have. There, there's definitely lots of different terms used to describe uh, the same defects. Um, my personal bias is against subpulmonary and subaortic VSD unless it's a double outlet right ventricle where you're helping describe the physiology because the, the aorta may not be in the typical aortic position and the pulmonary artery may not be in the typical pulmonic position. So, so just sort of describing it as, as you know, outlet. Um, so it, it, if it, 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 it tells you the, the location on the septum um, rather than the arterial relationship. But when you go into more complex lesions like double outlet, describing its relationship to the great arteries becomes extremely important. So that, that kind of ties into uh, something that, that um, Sujatha mentioned early on in her talk, that there's, there's sort of the two different schools of, of thought about uh, how, how we do our segmental analysis and, and, and go through. And, um, I, I think there's definitely people that are trained in one or the other and both, but within your own labs, do you use a, a single type of nomenclature? Do you jump back and forth between the two? How do you handle it? I have been through different training programs and you know changed schools <laughs> through the programs, but I would say, um, I think we use a combination. Um, it, I, some people are strong in one versus the other and have strong feelings about, you know, continuing that. Um, but we, we try to use a combination. Uh, most of the time, you know, we, we, I think we stick to one prep for the most part, but um, we see value in both. So you'll, you'll see sometimes the echo report varying between reports. Yeah, uh, I think um, not to get caught up in the different camps of either Andersonia or Von Prague, if you can just describe the physiology of the shunt or the lesion where the surgeon can understand it um, and help them with surgery, then usually that is the most helpful. <clears throat> um, and I don't think that um, getting stuck in one nomenclature is helpful uh, to anyone, um, but I think as a fellow training uh, in your program, it'll be very helpful if you could learn uh, two nomenclature systems. That way, wherever you go, you will understand what people are talking about. But the important thing I stress for our fellows is not to fight over the nomenclature, but to understand the physiology behind congenital heart disease. Yeah, and then I, I would add, I, I think in the reporting, um, as, as Penny alluded to, the most important thing is communicating in a way that your surgeon will understand. Um, and as, as cardiologists, as we may move from one institution to another and work with a surgeon who's trained um, under a different school of thought, we need to be bilingual. Um, we need to be able to com clearly communicate to the surgeon um, however they understand the anatomy. And sometimes if words doesn't work, just draw a picture and point to the spot <laughs> that sometimes, or take a heart model, and that would be very helpful. I mean, I think 3D printing now is very helpful for the surgeons, you know, or 3D echocardiography, you can turn it into the surgeon's view where they like to see it in their way so that they can understand and how to repair these defects. So sometimes pictures is worth a thousand words. Yeah, I was yeah, going to say that, 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 is, that is 3D echo. <laughs> <laughs> it, you it, use it, a is, lot it is great for Yeah, so we do a lot of 3D uh, pre-surgical planning. Uh, for instance, today was an AVSD. We use 3D echo to tell them the anatomic surgical view and where the inferior bridging leaflet and the superior bridging leaflet. And it's very interesting. I recently went to an industry... Um, the ASC industry uh, relations meeting and uh, um, Dr. Mackinson showed me an image that was atrial down and a 3D image and I was like that's a that's a cleft that's a mitral valve cleft and he said well a lot of people would have said that was a tricuspid valve but it wasn't it was a mitral valve cleft that looked like three leaflets right and the 
best part of that is they did a mitra clip. So to close it, instead of opening the chest up, so that's advancement in adult congenital heart disease. That's in your field, Lucy. I think that's very important. Um, and he said, because the orientation, like a mitra clip is anterior posterior, but you have three, a cleft, right? So he had to do right and left orientation. So your 3D image in your TE would be very helpful to you if you ever see that. It's definitely a continuum of care. And, you know, as our adult congenital patients just grow and grow in number, it's going to be very important to learn from pediatric radiologists. Um, and so um, with that, I want to thank you all for joining in on our lecture series. I think it was excellent discussion and, and very great questions. Um, I wanted to introduce you all to our, uh, or invite you all to our next lecture, which is going to be on October 18th. A uh, little change of topic is going to be on cardio obstetrics, and I think it's going to be very interesting. So please join us if you can on October 18th, and we look forward to seeing you all there. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.